Let me introduce to you, most of you know uh, Dr. Jim and Shirley Carroll, and uh, I had to twist their arm to be a part of this uh, interview in this sense. Uh, they said, everybody knows our story, and uh, it's, it's well, well too familiar. And I said, a lot of people don't know your story, and it fits in with this emphasis on integrating faith and work. I think we'll start, Jim, by just telling us how did you end up in Kuwait, and how, that, how does that relate to your skills as a physician, and particularly uh, how that translated for ministry? Is, is this on? Yes, but it's you know, so you need to speak right into it. There okay. We go. Well, uh, we went forward at a mission conference in 1986. And at that time, we really didn't have any idea what we were to do or what we wanted to do. We did, however, have one singular idea that we did not want to do, and that was go to the Middle East. Uh, now, the reasons for that were probably, my, well, I guess both of ours, right? Uh, but at that time, those of you who remember that re recall that uh, there were many hostages being taken back in uh, the Middle East, uh, well over 50 or 60 uh, British and American hostages that were held in Lebanon. So I really, I guess you could call it a phobia. I had a phobia about being a hostage. So not the Middle East. Well, one thing and another, the, the Lord put us down through a funnel of uh, what he wanted us to do, and uh, uh, this and that uh, possibility uh, came and went, and finally we ended up with Kuwait. Well, why Kuwait? Uh, Kuwait is a, is a pretty strict country in the Middle East. You can't get in there as a designated missionary. Uh, in order to get in to do any sort of mission work, you have to have a job. And uh, they, they needed a job, uh, needed me there in a job uh, in the medical school, uh, teaching uh, basically what I do here in the U.S. The other somewhat unique thing there is that uh, the medical school is taught in English. Uh, so it seemed like the ideal setting. There was a, a mission team there that we could join, and, uh, uh, and we could uh, uh, take part in that. And also use my skills as a physician. Um, so we thought we had the skills uh, that would fit that, and, and the team did as well. Uh, if I, I have a couple of slides, and if we could get those yeah. up. Uh, Shirley's uh, skills are probably better than mine, and uh, uh, here in this slide and the next one, and then I'm going to show you in a second, are two of my favorite. Uh, uh, slides of Shirley and how she uh, uh, melded in with the uh, the Bedouins and uh, here's Shirley out in the desert with her with her camel. Uh, she could tell you some stories she probably won't have time to today, but her skills fit in rather well. Uh, I thought my skills as a physician were the uh, were the ticket that the Lord could use there, but what what the Lord ended up using was my particular skill and that is getting trapped by an invading army. I'm not, I'm not sure why he gave me that skill, but anyway, that's where it landed. Okay. So you went to Kuwait, you took the family, Shirley. Tell us about what happened, maybe some early episodes when it all began. Well, uh, we enjoyed our time in Kuwait as a whole. The kids absolutely loved going down to the desert. We, uh, our mission board had told us that we were to seek out the uh, Kuwaitis, and the Kuwaiti Bedouins were the ones that our um, group was d focused upon. So a member of our team had taken me to the souk, which is an outdoor market, to buy the proper clothing, which was an, a black abaya, as you see these other ladies have on. And um, we, uh, the, all children 12 and under, which included all of our children at that time, uh, six of them. The seventh was John. He was older. And so we would go in our car down to the desert about an hour away and go visiting. And um, the ladies there were just very, very hospitable. They were very open and welcoming us. They um, knew Jimmy from the hospital. They trusted him as a doctor that had come to help them. And um, 
they were very open and they didn't hesitate to not understand why we would want to visit them because they thought that they were the superior group and that we would want to learn more about life from them. As time grew on, they began to trust me more, and they even got in the car with me, and we would go shopping. And I would leave our kids, who just had so much fun there, out playing with the snakes, the toy guns, <laughs> which I had never allowed in the house. And did you ride that? Did you ride that camel, Shirley? I didn't ride. Well, I, no, I don't think I did ride the camel, but our kids all did. Okay. And, and they climbed up on it. And I think I always had a baby in my arms and one screaming about it. <laughs> but we enjoyed our experience. You should have this. bought her several camels, Jim. <laughs> We, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, there was a camel down the street from where we lived, and we would go down and visit it uh, periodically. And then one day, we saw all this blood flowing in the street, and they had killed it. Mm. And so this was a common thing that you would see in the streets. Mm. But um, the camels were certainly a, a big part of their life. And um, Well, Jim, tell us about your early days, your experiences as well. Well, uh, of course, the first, uh, I guess, year and a half, almost two years there, went along pretty well. We went through the typical struggles that, that all uh, people in mission, uh, uh, missions do. But then uh, Shirley had to go home for surgery for one of our kids, and uh, I remained there. It happened that summer that I had the summer duty in Kuwait. And uh, everybody who can leave Kuwait during the summer does leave. It gets up to 120, 130 degrees. So uh, you don't stay there unless you, you must. Uh, and then in August, uh, I got a call from Shirley saying that uh, the Iraqis were on the border and uh, Jimmy get on a plane and come on home. Well, everything was fine in Kuwait. That mm -hmm. was one of my famous statements that lives in infamy, <laughs> in, infamy that everything is, is fine here, uh, no problem. Well, about 2 o'clock the next morning, the uh, Iraqi jets swooped down over the city, dropping bombs and strafing. And uh, I, I sort of figured at that point she had been right, <laughs> which is, is the usual outcome. Um, so what was the circumstance at that point? Uh, things went on rather strangely for a couple of days, but then the question began to arise, are the Iraqis taking hostages? Uh, and that was uncertain at first, but then some of my friends began to disappear and it, and it became clear. So I did have to avoid the Iraqis uh, as much as possible. I was working in the hospital, and it happened that I was the head of the unit at that time. So the uh, Iraqi commander who had taken over the hospital requested my presence. Uh, I declined. Uh, and at that point, I knew that I couldn't stay in, that, in our house any longer, so I, I went in with uh, some of our friends down the street, uh, Kuwaitis, who were very gracious to take me in. Uh, feed me, uh, protect me from uh, any Iraqis that might be searching the neighborhood. But then uh, the Iraqis announced that they would kill uh, any Kuwaitis who harbored Americans. So it was, it was time for me to leave. And uh, so then I, I decided I would go to the embassy. Uh, I didn't have much choice as another place to go. So I put on my white coat. Uh, put my stethoscope around my neck to look doctory. Uh, got in the car and uh, drove down. I thought I would avoid the checkpoints, but when I got to the checkpoints, I just drove slowly and waved uh, gently to the Iraqis. Uh, they weren't good soldiers. They, they didn't check me. Uh, and everybody knows you don't stop a doctor going someplace. So I did make it to the embassy. and. Uh, Things were pretty chaotic there for a while. There were lots of uh, uh, folks that lived in the town that were Americans. Most of them ended up leaving or getting out. And then I had a rather peculiar experience. Uh, you know in the movies how the Marines always come in and, and, and rescue you. Well, I got to see the Marines leave. Uh, 
the the Iraqis had promised uh, promised the embassy that the uh, that the Marines uh, could get out uh, would be allowed to leave, so they were taken out. Now the Iraqis did lie to them, like he, like they told many of many lies at the time, and they were taken prisoner in in Baghdad. Uh, then the Iraqis proceeded to shut off the water and electricity. Uh, the temperatures then were about 125. I had often wondered how the Bedouins in the desert were able to stand the, uh, the heat. Uh, well, I learned. Uh, you, you just uh, don't do very much uh, at, in, the, in the hot part of the day, and, and we were able to manage in that circumstance. Uh, we did have guard duty. Our main purpose in guard duty was to uh, uh, notify the embassy center uh, if the Iraqis breached the embassy uh, border. The, it's a bit, very big embassy. It was about five acres with lots of buildings in it. So we were in the guard posts. Our purpose was to notify the embassy center so that they could destroy the en encryption equipment if the Iraqis entered. So it was, it was a tense uh, situation. Uh, Right there next to the embassy was the International Hotel, which towered over the embassy, and, and, that, embassy, and that hotel housed the, uh, uh, housed the Iraqi officer corps. So they were looking down on us uh, all the time. Uh, there were bombings. Uh, the resistance bombed the embassy, uh, the International Hotel, while we were there and kill several of the Iraqi commanders. There were executions in the neighborhood uh, uh, near to us. So we, we were still not certain what was going on. And then there was a preparation for the attack uh, uh, that was to come at some point. The, we were afraid the military was going to have to get us out, so we cleared out the uh, parking lot from all the cars and all the stones and sticks that were in the parking lot so the helicopters could land. Uh, the idea being that there would be a period of uh, uh, a period of carpet bombing around the perimeter of the embassy, and then the uh, helicopters would swoop in and pick us up. Uh, I, I remember one of the diplomats uh, remarking to us as we were sitting around, she said, uh, we're toast. Uh, the, the, the message there was, uh, was pretty clear. And I kept going back to the Romans 8.28, all things work together for good for those who love God and called according to his purpose. Um, that had always been one of my favorite verses, but I couldn't figure out how that verse comported with what was happening here. Here I was, the father of seven, uh, working in a foreign country to try to help the people physically and also uh, spiritually. And, and so why was the Lord doing this? I, I couldn't figure it out. But it came down to this. My concern was that the Iraqis were going to come in and get us and take us, uh, take us somewhere else to be hostage. And, and this got back to my original fear. And, you know, I found myself going to the Lord saying, Lord, we talked about this, didn't we? Uh, I, I thought we had an agreement here. Uh, so that's kind of the state I was in in the first uh, couple of months. Shell shocked of sorts. Yes. Seriously. Yes. Now you were here with the children in the U.S. with no money. Jim talks about uh, the. Tell us about the bubble or what that's all about. But what was going on with you guys? Well, I, I realized that Jimmy had told me his last check wouldn't come through yet, but not to worry about. It. Well, it never came. And uh, then I realized that I had no money and I didn't have a resource to get money. I couldn't sell anything. I couldn't even sell stocks because it was in our name jointly. And so um, I got all of our bills canceled with uh, guidance and the mortgage payment, they delayed and the gas and the electric bill. And I had no trouble with all, any of this because it, our pictures and our story was all over the front page of the paper. So um, we, I decided that we would just open up our books. We had, all, had them all packed to go back to Kuwait, and we were doing homeschool. So we started in, and we started doing homeschool. And the Lord, through the church and the neighbors, provided for everything. Um, and the Watts provided a car. Uh, Phil Hedges, back in the back, 
came to visit us on a regular basis just about once a week as one of the elders from the church. And he would enjoy uh, my homemade muffins made from the food pantry and, uh, and uh, sat with us and enjoyed the children. And um, the Lord had just sort of put me into what I call the bubble because uh, I, I just felt so near to him and his comfort was so much there that he took care of us in this time. And I told the children that uh, God just had another plan for, for Papa and that he had to keep Papa in Kuwait for a while and um, it would be fine. And even though many of our friends and other people had told me to be real with our children and to let them ex be exposed to the reality of life, I, I felt sure that the Lord was going to protect us. The first indication that I had that he was totally in control was the uh, last time I talked to Jimmy, I was very concerned about our house. Uh, we had rented it for the year, and the people who were renting our house had decided not to take it. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was very concerned because I didn't think in two weeks' time, which is when I planned to leave, uh, that I could get the house rented. And the, if the Lord had not changed these plans and had not made these people supernaturally decide not to take our house, then we would have had no place to stay. And that was his first indication to me that he had everything under control. And this kept up day by day as uh, food came in from the neighbors, love, support, and from the church and all those around us. So you're in the embassy, you're struggling to survive, you're struggling in your faith, and tell us about what transformed that eventually led you back to Andrews Air Force Base in D.C. Well, we were, uh, we were in the embassy, uh, you know, we were pretty proud of our record. Uh, some of you, may, probably not many of you anymore, are familiar with the old movie, 55 Days in Peking. Uh, we got to that, uh, we got to 55 days and we were proud that we had, uh, had broken the record uh, for the uh, longest siege of an American embassy in history, uh, taking a little, uh, uh, a little glory in that at the time. But I should have been more attentive to what the Lord was doing, uh, uh, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Uh, so. It was a little slow in coming around, but gradually I began to see what the Lord was doing there. And uh, it's easy to look back now and see what was happening, but it, it was hard at the time. Uh, you know, we, we did have plenty of food, but it wasn't the kind of food that we, uh, we wanted. I'll get to that in, in a moment. But at that point, uh, some of us got together and began trapping pigeons. Uh, and uh, I guess the pigeons were as hungry as we were, so we could bait them up pretty easily. But in looking back at that, Exodus 16, uh, 13, in the evening the quail came up and covered the camp. Uh, that's what I think of was happening then. And then the other, another point on that is that uh, one of the foods, one of the uh, good food sources that we did have uh, was tuna. We had 6,000 cans of tuna. <laughs> and, uh, you know, e even to this day, I like a good tuna steak. Uh, uh, but it has to be uh, good grade uh, sushi tuna. But, but we had the cans of tuna. Uh, I found that the best way to eat the tuna was by putting barbecue sauce on it. Uh, <laughs> I calculated up the, uh, the uh, amount of tuna that I needed to eat each day in order to get my protein requirement, and that was two cans of tuna. Uh, I think I was probably the only one that was consuming uh, uh, tuma, uh, tuna regularly there. But now I think back to that point uh, with Exodus 16.31. Now the house of Israel called its name manna, and it was like coriander seed, uh, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Uh, that was the Lord's manna. And, and I brought some home. Uh, this is uh, one of the cans. I, I'm not sure what it would taste like at this point. It's been, uh, well, well over 25 years. Uh, 
but uh, why did I bring that home? Well, Exodus 16.33 says, Take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. And so I brought home as many of these cans as I could carry. We weren't allowed to carry much as we got out. But we, I think this tuna in a, in a tin can will be around a long time, probably a long time uh, after we are. And our, uh, our descendants can look on this and see what the Lord did to provide for us uh, back in those days. Uh, it's, it's for our generations. So Shirley, when you began to hear that it's possible Jim might be coming home to the U.S., tell us about how you reacted and the challenges you had and figure out what you should do. Well, I had been thinking about going to, back to uh, Iraq because I had heard that Saddam Hussein had uh, promised to release some of the hostages if their wives would come back and talk to him about this. But that wasn't the Lord's plan. And um, I had planned to do this over Christmas vacation because John was at this point, going, our oldest son, was going tuition free to Covenant College. So um, I, uh, I heard that the State Department had been calling us, and, and Jimmy and I were allowed to send Bible verses back and forth. A favorite one that he would send was Romans 8.28, and I would send it back, and we knew that things were okay, and we were doing fine. And um, so the State Department called, and they said that some hostages were going to be released. And they didn't know that if Jimmy would be one of them. They didn't know if it was people from the embassy, but they were being released. They weren't going to put them on the plane. The one thing they knew was that there was a doctor among them. So and the Watts had donated a car to the church, and the church had allowed us to use that car for this period of time. And I packed up the children with permission and got everybody um, ready, and we drove to Washington, D.C., to uh, Andrews Air Force Base when they said that he would be arriving. And we got there and there was a huge room and we all stood and we waited, which seemed like hours. And the plane arrived and all these people came off, the hostages came off, we saw the greetings, we saw all this going on and I stood there. And I thought, how could I have made such a mistake? Why did I act on my own? Here I am doing something that was not the Lord. I just got this idea and decided to do this. And as I stood there and waited, um, Peter, who had separated himself from us, said he was the first to see. But Ruth was standing by me, and she said, there's Dad. And so uh, we all met, and we all... Uh, got together again, and I knew that Jimmy was all right because one of the first things he told me was, uh, have you heard about the children that are, need adoption in Romania? And, <laughs> and later he, he had told me that his time in Kuwait had been some of his best time. And I thought, how can this be? How can he have had such a wonderful time in Kuwait and not have time with me? <laughs> and... Um, he said, because at this time, he came so close to the Lord. You know, uh, before we hear from you, Jim, the lessons you learn in the book, uh, there, it's adorable, Jim titles, Chapter 22, Shirley to the Rescue. And not only your prayers, but uh, I mentioned this in the Christmas Eve service. You wrote a letter to Saddam Hussein, and much like Moses speaking to the Pharaoh, you said, let my husband go. Uh, basically, I plead you to grant him an exit visa so that we could allow, be allowed to return. I think you were wanting to go back to Kuwait, but then they wouldn't let you. Isn't that right? Yes, I didn't have a visa. And yeah, yeah. Um, but Jim, you've shared with me and you share in the book. We'll talk about the book in a second. But uh, what are the lessons that the Lord taught you as you reflect back? Well, there were a lot, as, as you can probably imagine. Uh, you know, one, one of the things was our Thanksgiving time there, and uh, uh, we had so many provisions at that time that, that it was hard for even the non-believers in, in the group to, to avoid saying uh, uh, the, the verse from uh, uh, the 23rd Psalm, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy, because that is exactly what happened. Uh, but going back to Romans 8.28, all things work together for good for those who love God and called according to his purpose. You know, I've, I finally got the verse. And, and the key part 
in Jim's opinion, is that it's a last part. It's according to his purpose. Uh, we may think as we go through this, these difficulties that what we have in front of us uh, is what the Lord is interested in, but he's, he's, in, he's interested in his purpose. And that when we can surrender to that, that that's, that's when we get home. The other thing is, is the faith part of it. For grace we have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Any faith that we have in a circumstance like this uh, is what carries us through. And there's a, there's a song uh, by Michael Perry, uh, Perry uh, God Beyond All Praising, and, and whether our tomorrows be filled with good or ill, we'll triumph through our sorrows and rise to bless you still. Uh, you can't do that every morning when you're in a fix like this, but if you do it sometime, I can promise you it's going to help. And the, other, the last thing uh, is that... Uh, how quickly the Lord can change these kinds of things. Uh, uh, he can use our skills, yes, but he's the one who does the work. He's the one who finishes it off. Uh, 15, uh, Corinthians 15, uh, 51 and 52, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in, a, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Um, that's how fast God can do things. How fast is the twinkling of an eye? I think that's light speed. Mm -hmm. And that's, as fat, that's the speed at which God is able to act in situations like this. It may not be in our time. And even here, if God had, not, had chosen not to take care of me, he would still have the same exact character. Well, what I appreciate about that is... Uh, your perspective that it's the Lord that's rescuing, it's the Lord that's providing for you here. Yes, you were praying. Yes, you were petitioning the embassy. Charlie Green reminded me that other reservists and, and full-time soldiers were deployed. God used the military, but ultimately it was the hand of God and it, and it will be God's hand. I've really enjoyed this book, Faith in Crisis. We're going to be selling this book uh, in the Commons area uh, this evening before and, and after the services but I'm excited about the new book that's coming out. You allowed me to uh, read it in advance. Tell us about that, and I'll tell, I'll tell why I'm excited about that. Well, this is, this is a novel that uh, I've been working on for several years, and I think it's going to be the first of a trilogy about uh, Kuwait. This tells the story of a Kuwaiti Muslim who tried to escape God, but who was caught by him anyway. And uh, so we'll be looking forward to the release of that. What I found interesting about that book was that if you're seeking to know how to talk to Muslims about Christianity, and really not just in apologetics, but to walk them through lovingly the testimony of the gospel and uh, the clarity of salvation in Christ alone, I found it in novel form. This book, I think, is going to be very helpful for those who want to speak to Muslims and talk to them about their faith. Let me pray for us. Thank you so much for sharing. And I know you're, we're not going to give you a pause, but let's just give the Lord uh, thankfulness for this story. Let me close us in prayer, and then we'll have some time of fellowship before uh, our 11 o'clock service. We are reminded, Father, that all things do work together for good, and that doesn't mean that all things are good, but it does mean that it's the purposes that you've called us to. Even at this missions conference, we're going to be talking and understanding more about the call of God. Help us to know what it means to follow Jesus in every area of our lives, to be steadfast, unmoved, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Thank you for redeeming every part of this story and continuing to use Shirley and Jim through their writings and through telling this story to inspire us, also to sober us in the reminder that uh, you've called us uh, to advance into the world, and Lord, it's not a safe place. It's not a place that will welcome us always, or a place, as we heard in the sermon this morning, that um, will uh, be friendly to us. Thank you that Jesus, as our friend, calls us out and gives us the courage because of his cross and his love for us to fulfill your work and to build a testimony that Jesus is worthy of all praise, glory, honor, and obedience. 
Continue to guide us this week. Lord, it's a busy week. I pray that we would align our schedules to hear more about what it means to integrate faith and work into our calling and how to live faithfully uh, under the cross, the power of Christ. Uh, Use the speakers that will come. Use the events. Teach us, we pray, that we might fulfill your work in this world and in this city for Christ's sake. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.